Hello, 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 and welcome to another fun-filled edition of the Subsection Business Fundamentals Lecture Series. I'm your host, Michael Rice. Happy, happy Monday, everybody. Happy, happy Monday. I hope you all had an absolutely wonderful weekend, and I hope you're all uh, headed into a very exciting week. I know I sure am, and I wanted to, and I told you guys about this in the last uh, Business Fundamentals lecture, that I wanted to do um, at least one of these where we went really far in depth, um, and we kind of started a series on, uh, like, having a sneaker reselling business that could be a little bit more appealing to a general audience. Um, so a lot of what we're going to talk about in this lecture is probably stuff that a lot of you guys already know about. I'm also going to share my screen. My Discord may crash when I do. If so, I'll be right back. Okay, it didn't crash. Good. Um, so uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is probably stuff that you guys already know. But this is going to be part of a course uh, that we'll use to hopefully advertise uh, Subsection and Cardio Cash Out in the future. Um, so we're going to talk about starting a sneaker reselling business uh, from a very general standpoint. Um, we are going to go way back to the beginning of all of this. I'm going to go through things super in depth, um, how to do this from start to finish. And then uh, at the end of it, you guys can ask any questions that you have and we can kind of go through through any of the more complicated stuff, but this lecture should take you from knowing nothing about sneakers, nothing about streetwear, and get you to the point where you would be able to start a profitable sneaker reselling business. So, any questions about that? Any questions about context before we get started? So this is going to be a longer one. We should be good to go. Let's hit it. So, starting a sneaker reselling business. Okay. Step one of all of this is market analysis, right? Um, and we talked about this in a previous lecture, but the idea is that we need to understand the sneaker reselling market and how the reseller fits in. We as resellers do not control anything about the product or the demand for the product. Rather, we bring available products to motivated buyers. And so we had talked about this over in this lecture, right? Where we talked about the different steps um, to sneakers and streetwear, right? Things go from a manufacturer, uh, manufacturers have a hype product, that hype product has a resale value, um, people then source that product, people resell that product for a profit. We talked about all of this in the last lecture, right? Um, pretty much exactly how to do it and the market analysis for sneakers and streetwear. And that's step one of starting your own reselling business is really understanding how this market works and where resellers fit into this market. Um, so I will let you guys know that this is one of the first mistakes that I see people make as resellers. One of the first mistakes is that people don't really understand where they fit in to any of this, right? A sneaker reseller will kind of like get involved in a lot of this and they'll think, oh, okay, I only need to, you know, focus on the most popular products. I should only do Dunks. I should only do Jordan 4s. I should only do Yeezys. I should only sell on StockX, right? People kind of forget what their role as a reseller is and the role that we play in the market. The role that we play in this market is bringing available products to motivated buyers. We have zero control over which things are profitable. We have no control over which things are popular. We have no control over the demand of the product. We have no control over the supply of the product. Our only job as resellers is to bring available products to motivated buyers, and that's it. That's what we should be focused on, right? Not necessarily bringing the most popular products or bringing the most hype products or bringing the most profitable products, instead bringing available products to motivated buyers in a profitable way. So this is step one, analyzing the market, understanding what the market is. We talked about this in a previous lecture, so I'm not going to go too far in depth, but does this make sense to everybody? Does this make sense? Got like 20 people in this lecture and zero chatters. Everybody's on their phone right now. Everyone's got one AirPod in. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Isaac Bonga. Okay. So, 
next step, once we've analyzed the market, once we understand how we work as sneaker resellers, right? Now we want to do something that I call bucket acquisition, okay? And to understand why I'm calling this bucket acquisition, we need to understand in a general sense how resources work from a business perspective, okay? So, a lot of you are familiar just very one-dimensionally with resources for a business. And when I say this, I mean a lot of you only think about money as far as a resource is concerned for your business, right? But there are really three different types of buckets that we have as business owners, right? There's our capital, so this is the money, right? There's our audience, so these are our, you know, like, these are our buyers, these are our suppliers, things like that. And there's also our infrastructure, Right? Our infrastructure are the things that keep our business rolling. So maybe this is something like your actual platform accounts. Maybe this is something like your Zen business account or your Fiverr account or your email address. Right. So there are different buckets for different resources that we have as business owners. And step two of starting a reselling business is to go out and get these buckets. So the reason that I'm calling them a bucket right? Is because this is the way that I think about resources as a business. If you think about money, for example, the amount of money that your business has, a good way to think about this is as an infinite bucket, right? You essentially have a bucket and money is water in that bucket. And as that water level rises, you're going to be exposed to different holes in the bucket, holes that you as the business owner need to patch up. And as you patch more and more holes, the money in your business can rise and rise and rise, right? There's an infinite amount of it that can go into that bucket. That bucket is infinitely expanding. And as it expands, so too will you find different holes and cracks and crevices that need to be patched in. So, with this being the case, our second step is to go out and get all of these buckets. And the good news is that the vast majority of these buckets are free, right? So the resources that we'll need to use in our reselling business are capital, audience, and infrastructure. And you can see here, whoops, you can see here that I've gone ahead and I've written out exactly what buckets you should get and I've organized them for you. So on the capital side of things, right, you're going to need a bank account, you're going to need Cash App, you're going to need Zelle, you'll need a Bitcoin wallet, you'll need an Ethereum wallet, you'll need a PayPal account, you'll need credit cards, you'll need Apple Cash, you'll need a savings account. On the audience side, you'll need Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, a website, YouTube, TikTok, Reddit. On the infrastructure side, you'll need an email address, you'll need a stock account, eBay account, Mercari, Poshmark, Alias, Goat Grail, Amazon, Zen Business, and Fiverr, right? In my mind, all of these buckets are necessary for our reselling business. And I know that this seems like a lot, but a lot of you guys probably already have most, if not all, of these buckets. So, in acquiring these, we are essentially giving ourselves storage for the things that are to come in our business. Our Instagram account, for example, is a storage or a bucket for our audience, right? This is a place where we can store audience members. People on Instagram can follow your account. They can put themselves into storage, right? Your Bitcoin wallet is storage for money. This is a place where money can be stored, it can be transferred into, it can be transferred out of, etc. Your email address is storage for infrastructure for your business, right? This is how you can communicate with your shippers, this is how you can communicate with your suppliers, etc., etc., right? So all of these things act as storage for the different resources in our business, whether that resource is capital, audience, or infrastructure. So let's go a step further here as far as what stages or what steps should you take to acquire these buckets? I'm going to make this as easy as possible for you guys and give you a quick step-by-step -step guide. So step number one, make sure that your business name is available in your state. This will save you headaches later on. All you have to do is Google your state plus LLC lookup, and then you're going to look for your business name, right? So I'll show you here. So I will go to Pennsylvania, right? LLC lookup, right? <laughs> Pennsylvania LLC lookup, and look, I can find PA.gov, record searches, business, Pennsylvania Department of State, okay? So once I'm here, I can click on business entity search, and this will vary by state. 
And all I need to do here is look if I am searching for a business entity, if I'm looking at UCC, whatever the case is, right? So free business search. Okay. All I'll search here is Caudio search, and I can see here the three different uh, businesses that make up Caudio, right? Caudio Consultations LLC, Caudio Immediates Inc., and also Caudio Productions LLC, all filed in the state of Pennsylvania, right? So this will allow me to see if my business name is currently available, if it's currently active with the state, whatever the case is. Let's say I wanted to have uh, Mike's Kicks LLC, right? Search. I can see that that's not currently an entity with the state of Pennsylvania. So if I wanted to start that LLC, I would be able to, and I could be resting assured that I am not interrupting anybody else's trademarks. Does this make sense? So step one, I'm going to go and I'm going to go make sure that my business name is available in my state, that no one else is using it. So I'll look for my LLC lookup in my state and I will search the business name that, I intending, that I'm intending on using and make sure that nobody else is using it. Okay, so once I'm confident that I've got a good business name to use, I'm going to go make a Google Workspace account and I'm going to pay for the professional email. It should be my name at businessname.com. So for example... Right. For example, mine is Michael at CaudioConsulting.com. Michael at CaudioConsulting.com. So again, if I search Caudio here, I can see Caudio Consultations or Caudio Consulting. This is an LLC that I own. So I have the email Michael at CaudioConsulting.com. I also have the email Mike at CaudioProductions.com. Right. So again, we want to make sure that we are using our name and then our business name. This is just very good practice across the board. This is going to make things, as far as organizing them in the long term, a hell of a lot easier. You are going to have to give out your email dozens, if not hundreds of times over the course of your business. So having a good professional email address just gives you the ability to share something that immediately instills a little bit of confidence in your business. If you're sharing like Mike's Kicks 420 at gmail.com, that doesn't sound nearly as professional. It's not going to give nearly as good of an impression as Michael at CaudioConsulting.com does. And it's only like, I think, seven bucks a month to have that professional email address, so it's definitely worth it, considering this is going to be the hub for all of the infrastructure of your business. So, step one, make sure your LLC name is available in your state. Step two, go and get that professional email for that LLC name. Once you have that email address, go over to Zen Business and pay for your LLC. So, go get an LLC right off the bat. A lot. I see somebody in chat already asking, when is an LLC necessary? That's a complicated question, but essentially, as far as you guys are concerned, you should get an LLC right off the bat. An LLC is going to protect your personal assets from any legal liabilities. It is not entirely necessary. You do not need to get an LLC. You can operate as a sole proprietor, but if you're going to operate as a sole proprietor, you better know the differences. You better know what you're doing. Um, you better understand that your personal assets will now be up for grabs as far as legal liability is concerned, believe me when I say you're better off getting an LLC right off the bat. If you're looking to save money, then you can do the EIN yourself, right, through irs.gov. It's free to do. Um, services like Zen Business will charge you to do it, but you can choose to opt out of that and do it yourself through irs.gov. And you can also uh, talk to a local attorney about being your registered agent instead of using a registered agent service. So, for example, we can see here, right, every LLC needs to have a registered agent. And you can see that when I started Caudio Productions LLC, I went ahead and I used the registered agent offered to me by LegalZoom. But you can see for the next two business entities that we created here, we use Brockton's office as our registered agent. The Skeen firm is my attorney, Brockton, and he's a registered agent for all of my businesses now. So this is far, far, far less expensive than using the ones that LegalZoom or um, Zen Business offer. But again, like when you go through LegalZoom or Zen Business, like maybe getting the registered agent is like 600 bucks. Um, if you talk to a local attorney, they'll do it for like 50 bucks a year. You know what I mean? So it's not that bad at all. So anyway... Right. If you're looking to save some money when you do your LLC, um, do the EIN yourself and do the registered agent through a local attorney's office. Make sense?
All right. I'm a dummy and paid $250 for any I am. I think everybody does with their first business. I think everybody does with their first business. Okay. So step one, get your email address. Step two, get your LLC. Once you have your LLC and your email address, then you're going to open a business bank account. I recommend opening one with Bluevine, right? So this is why we're doing this in this order. Right? You're going to need an email address to open a bank account. You're also going to need an EIN to open a business bank account. So do those two things first, then open your business bank account. I recommend Bluevine. The reason that I recommend Bluevine is because they give you interest on all of your balances up to $100,000, I believe, um, and they give a really, really, really good interest rate. Obviously, depending on when you're listening to this recording or when you're watching this lecture, there might be better options out there for you. I think Bluevine is a good all-around option, but step three is open up a bank account. So... Once you open up that bank account, now you're going to go through and you're going to get all your capital buckets and you'll link them to your business bank account. So once you have this bank account, you're going to go through, you'll get Cash App, you'll get Zelle, you'll get a Bitcoin wallet, you'll get an Ethereum wallet, you'll get a PayPal account, you'll get credit cards, you'll get Apple Cash, and you'll get a savings account, right? That all starts with your business bank account. So your Cash App is going to link to your business bank account. Your Zelle is going to link to your business bank account. Your Bitcoin wallet is going to link to your business bank account. Your Ethereum wallet is going to link to your business bank account. Your PayPal account is going to link to your business bank account, right? This is why we do this so early on in the process, because we're going to need an email address for each of these things, and we're going to need a bank account for most of these things. So by having those two things right off the bat, now we can link everything through that way. Once you have all your capital buckets, go through and get all of your infrastructure buckets, and then finally your audience buckets. So once you have all of those, now you'll go through and you'll get a StockX account, right? And then you'll link that to your PayPal account, which is linked to your business bank account. Then you'll get an eBay account, which will be linked directly to your business bank account and your PayPal. Then you'll get Mercari, then you'll get Poshmark, Alias, Goat Ground, Amazon, Zen Business, etc. right? So does it make sense why we're doing things in this order? We start off with the email address, then we get the LLC, then we get the bank account, then we do everything else. Does this make sense to you guys? So, yes, I haven't done any of these yet. That's fine. That's fine. So the cool thing about this, right, the cool thing about this is once you've gone through all of this, once you've ended up this process... Everything's going to be linked to one email address. Everything's going to be linked to one bank account, right? You aren't going to have anything in your personal name. It's all going to be through your business name, and that keeps things as easy as humanly possible. And it's going to save you so many headaches because the way that a lot of people do this is whenever they very first start off their sneaker reselling business, they might be using like their personal cash app, right? And then their personal Zelle. Then they might get an LLC and then they might get an email address. So now they've got two different email addresses, right? One for their cash app and Zelle and then one for their business stuff. And then they might say, well, I don't need another cash app. So I'll just go through and I'll get like, you know, my Reddit account under my business email or I'll get my Grailed account under my personal email or whatever the case is. And now you're stuck for the rest of your business hunting through different email addresses, trying to find the different things that you need, keeping everything organized in one spot. Meanwhile, if you do things this way, if you do things this way, it's all going to be housed in one email address through one bank account. It keeps all your tax shit organized. It keeps all of your like sales stuff organized. Easy as pie to do. Easy as pie to do. So does this kind of make sense why we want to do this in this order? Does this kind of make sense to you guys? Yes, definitely. Okay. So once you have all of these accounts, and here's here's the thing, right? I'm going to give you guys this piece of advice. None of you are going to do it, okay? Including those of you watching this on YouTube, none of you are going to use this actual piece of advice. Mark my words, you'll regret it, okay? Mark my words, you'll regret it. Once you have all of these accounts, take the time to watch YouTube videos about how to use them before you progress into the next step, right? None of you guys are going to sit down and watch a YouTube video on how to use a Gmail account. None of you guys are going to do it, but you should. And the reason that you should is you would be shocked the amount of tools that are available to you for free 
through each of these accounts if you just watch one fucking YouTube video about it. Literally one YouTube video about it will like change your life on each of these things, right? Take the time to sit down and watch a YouTube video about your MetaMask wallet for your Bitcoin account. Take the time to watch a YouTube video about a PayPal account. Take the time to watch a YouTube video about Reddit accounts, right? I know it seems redundant. I know it seems redundant because we already know how to use these platforms, but if you take the time to sit down and learn about them, you will be very surprised the amount of additional tools that you have access to. So for example, a lot of you are familiar that like with a Gmail account, you get access to the entirety of like the Google apps, right? So you get Google Docs, you get Google Sheets, you get Google Workspace, you get all of these things, but not a lot of you understand just how powerful these tools are. Like a lot of you don't understand that you could sign PDF documents using nothing but Google Workspace. Like you can have your signature imported and be able to sign documents via PDF just through Google Workspace. And I know that that doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but think about getting a contract. Think about having a contract emailed over to you and then needing to print that contract, sign it, take pictures with your phone, send it back to the person. Think about all the time that you're wasting doing that. We're watching literally one YouTube video about a Google Workspace could save you all of that time, right? I get it. It seems redundant. I get it. You already think that you know how all of these accounts work, but take the extra time to do this step. It is incredible the amount of tools that you have access to through these accounts. Just do it. You might think you already know how to use each of these things to their fullest potential, but if you take the time to learn it in depth anyway, it's going to make a lot more sense. Plus, most of these tools are 100% free. Most of these tools are 100% free. So you're kind of doing yourself a disservice by not at least learning how to use them right? You get access to a lot of stuff with a meta account. A lot of you guys don't understand how valuable a meta account is. And a lot of you guys don't understand how to link Facebook and Instagram together. If you link Facebook and Instagram together, if you link those two things together, you get double the advertising for free, right? So again, I get it. You already think you know how this stuff works. Watch the videos anyway. It's going to save you thousands of dollars in the long term. Okay. So that covers step two. That covers bucket acquisition. Does this make sense to you guys? So do you all understand what buckets you need, what order to get them in, things like that? Do you have any questions about the buckets? Sounds great. Excellent. Okay. This is a cheat sheet for you guys, by the way. And I'll be sharing this document with all of you also. So step three is product acquisition. So once we have all our buckets set up, we need to familiarize ourselves with product acquisition. So what we're going to do, now that we have all these accounts, we are going to spend time on eBay, StockX, Facebook Marketplace, etc. And we're going to get a feel for particular sneakers and clothing items. At the time of writing or recording this, so like right now, Jordan 4's Nike Dunks, Easy Slide, and Essentials Clothing items are all extremely popular. Beyond just popularity, though, try to understand the price fluctuation of different items by platform. Again, at the time of writing this, so like right now, StockX tends to have the lowest payouts, while Goat and eBay tend to have the highest. If you're in a state of waiting in your business, you should be spending time researching these things. This is what's going to separate a good reseller from the best resellers. This is what's going to separate a good reseller from the best resellers, is the amount of time they spend researching products. I get it, nobody wants to be a nerd, but if you guys don't become nerds with the way that different products move, you're never going to make it. If there's somebody doing more work than you, you aren't going to make it because they're trying to make more money than you. So... What you want to be doing is you want to constantly be on eBay, you want to be on StockX, you want to be on Goat, you want to be on Grail, you want to be on Mercari, and you want to understand how these products are moving, what's popular and when, what prices are doing on different platforms, things like that. Something that we don't talk nearly enough about as resellers is the ability to manipulate platforms to make a profit, right? Different products sell for different prices on different platforms. You can make a tremendous amount of profit just by understanding the price differences between platforms. You can make money buying from StockX and selling on Grail. 
If you know the right products to do that, you can do that. You can make money buying products on eBay and selling them on, you know, Amazon. You can make money by doing these different things, by manipulating these platforms. And the only way you're going to find out how to do that is by taking a look at individual products and understanding how they operate across platforms. Does this make sense? So this is what you should be doing at product acquisition. So it's also important to understand that as your business grows, you're going to be exposed to many different avenues of supply. At your start, you shouldn't be focused on finding the best suppliers. Instead, turn your focus to a consistent supply for one item that you feel confident in being able to sell. At the time of writing this, clothing items uh, tend to sell fairly cheaply online, and a person can make substantial it- or profits by selling these items locally, especially on essentials tees and hoodies. So right now, out there for you guys are essentials clothing. These clothing items tend not to perform so well online, right? You guys saw this with our stretch limo drop. You can pick up essentials tees sometimes under retail, right, depending on where you're buying them. Those teas selling in person, selling locally, you can make tremendous amounts of profits. I know that Saint is in chat right now. Saint cleans up on clothing items with his store, right? This is his bread and butter. It's one of these things where if you understand the market like Saint does for particular items, you can make a tremendous amount of money. Even right now in our active stock here in subsection, we've got Bravest Shorts for 30 bucks a unit. You look at Grail, these are selling between like 70 to 150 bucks a pair, right? These are things that you guys can be manipulating, that you guys can be taking advantage of to rake in massive profits. Plus, it's summertime in like pretty much every part of the United States right now. You guys should be able to take items like Bravest Shorts or Essentials Tees and take advantage of the season and be able to make a massive amount of money. So again, at the start... It's not a matter of understanding every single thing about product sourcing. It's not a matter of finding the best suppliers. It's not a matter of finding the most popular SKUs. It's a matter of finding one good thing. One good thing. Find one good avenue to source it. Find one good avenue to sell it. Everything in business starts with one good thing. So find one good source and use that. Obviously, I'm going to recommend you guys use Subsection and Cardio Cash Out for your one good source, but there are thousands of good sources out there that you'll be able to use. Does this also make sense? This is an area that a lot of you get stuck on. A lot of you are looking for the best of the best when you should be looking for one good thing. Okay. So, another great place to start is the national retailers, right? Nike Outlet Store, JD, Champs, Finish Line, etc. All of these places have plenty of good stock that can be purchased in-store for lower prices than the items sell for online. An afternoon trip to your local Nike store can yield hundreds, if not thousands of dollars in profit. Don't be afraid to bring your phone with you and research pricing data on location. Also, take this opportunity to develop relationships with store managers, as these can be incredibly beneficial long-term. I will tell you guys that when I started a lot of this sneaker reselling stuff, I sent my parents. Now, mind you, my dad is in his 60s. My mom is in his 50s. Or my mom is in her, uh, sorry, 50s. (laughs) My dad's in his 60s. My mom is in her 50s. I sent my parents to our local Nike outlet. They made hundreds of dollars in one afternoon. Hundreds of dollars in one afternoon. Not knowing hardly anything about technology, not knowing hardly anything about sneakers, they were able to make hundreds of dollars in one afternoon by going to a Nike outlet. A lot of you guys are lazy. A lot of you guys won't actually walk into the store. A lot of you guys think that you're better than that. A lot of you guys think, oh, well, I'm part of all of these groups. I shouldn't have to go into Nike stores anymore. I shouldn't have to go into outlets anymore. I shouldn't have to go to JD. I shouldn't have to go to Champs. I shouldn't have to go to Finish Line. You're wrong. This is your responsibility as a reseller is to bring available products to motivated buyers. You should always be going to these places. You should always be sourcing from these places. A lot of you guys started off doing this. A lot of you guys started off doing this and then you forgot. And then you got a little bit too obsessed with Discord or you got a little bit too obsessed with botting or you got a little bit too obsessed with bulk and you stopped doing this. 
right? When you stop doing this, you stop making money. Keep doing this. You need one good thing in business, and this is a good thing, right? I get it. None of us like the stereotype. None of us like to be one of those guys with their phone out, checking the stock X prices at the back wall of a Nike store. None of us like to be that guy. Unfortunately for all of you, that guy is making hundreds, if not thousands of dollars on each trip, where you guys are striking out day after day after day on the sneakers app, right? Don't be afraid to be the newbie. Don't be afraid to keep doing this. This is a really good place to start if you're starting your reselling business, and this is a really good place to stay all through your reselling business. Does this make sense as well? Does this make sense as well? Yes. Okay. So that concludes step three as far as figuring out your product acquisition. Do we have any questions about step three here on the product acquisition side? No questions? How do you build those manager relationships? It's honestly just a matter of introducing yourself. And we'll go over a quick concept here that I think will help you guys, like, I, I think it'll help solve a lot of your social anxieties as far as this is concerned, okay? So, before you ever introduce yourself, before you ever introduce yourself, think about a store manager. A store manager is either going to be willing to enter into a relationship with a reseller or they aren't. They're either willing to do it or they aren't. Before they even meet you, they're either willing to do it or they are not willing to do it. Meeting you has zero bearance on that. There are very, very, very few people out there that are totally undecided, that actually need convincing. There are plenty of store managers out there right now that are willing to enter relationships with resellers, and there are plenty of store managers out there that aren't. This comes back to a key business idea that my dad taught me a long time ago that has saved me tens of thousands of dollars in headaches, which is some will, some won't, so what? Some store managers will be willing to enter in relationships with you guys, some will not be willing to enter relationships with you guys, so what? So what? All you can do is try. All you can do is ask. Either you're going to ask and you're going to find out that store manager was not willing to, or you're going to ask and you're going to find out that that store manager was willing to. Chances are you're going to get a no. All you need is one yes to make tons of money. All you need is one yes to make tons of money. I'll give you guys one example before we move on to the next step here. Nordstrom Sales Associates. Nordstrom has a Nike account, and Nordstrom Sales Associates still make commission on everything that they sell. If you put those two pieces together, there's a very good relationship there, where these Nordstrom Sales Associates are making a commission on every single pair of Nike shoes that they sell, and they sell those pairs of Nike shoes for retail. They get Panda Dunks in all the time. They get Dunks in all the time. And these sales associates can access your account without you even being in store. One good relationship with a Nordstrom sales associate can get you a pair of dunks every single week. Every single week, right? I get it that one pair of dunks a week might not sound that great, but if that's $30 a week over 52 weeks in a year, that's 1500 bucks a year that you're going to make just from developing a relationship with one Nordstrom sales associate. One Nordstrom sales associate. So don't be afraid to ask. Okay. Any other questions about product acquisition before we continue on? Doesn't seem like it. So let's continue on to step four, which is organization. Okay. Once you guys have completed step three, you should have a pretty good idea of at least one product that you're going to source and that you're going to try to sell. So at this stage in your business, you should say, all right, I have narrowed it down. I am going to be the essentials t-shirt guy. I've learned everything about essentials t-shirts. I've found really cheap places to source them online, and I know where I can sell them locally, right? I figured out my thing. As soon as you figure out that thing, as soon as you figure out that thing, that one thing that you're going to do, the minute you do that, you should change your attention from um from sourcing to collecting and organizing data 
As a reseller, you should know the following information about your products. When you purchase the item, what you paid, where you purchased the item, the market price at the time of purchase, how you paid for the product, where the item is being sold, and any notes that you have. You should also leave space for this data, when you sold it, what you got paid, where you sold it, how you got paid, how the item was delivered, including tracking numbers if available, the name, email, phone of the purchaser, this is very important, and any notes about the sale. Okay, so why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? The reason that we're doing this is to save ourselves headaches and also to make our business more efficient in the long term, right? If you've been reselling for a while, if you're anything like me, there has come a time where some question about a sale happens after the fact. Maybe it's a question about the authenticity of your product. Maybe it's a question about the date that something sold. Maybe it's a question about the price that somebody paid. Or maybe it's just a blatant lie somebody else is telling about you. If you don't have this organ if you don't have this information organized, you're fucked. You need to be able to organize your information at every turn. So you need all of this information for every single transaction from the beginning of your business to the end. I know it seems redundant. I know it seems like a lot of extra work for no reason. Believe me, this is going to save you a lot of time. Okay, so we're going to make sure to keep any and all documentation about our products and sales, including any tax forms from platforms and email confirmations. It seems like a waste of time at the onset, and honestly, it will be more often than not, but having this data long-term can save you so many headaches, especially come tax season. So let me give you guys an example here, right? If you are tracking every single bit of information on all of your sales, it's going to take maybe 10 minutes on each transaction. It's going to take maybe 10 minutes on each transaction to actually document everything, right? Now, 90% of the time, that 10 minutes is just going to be a blatant waste. You aren't going to have ended up needing to do that. However, however, that one time that 10% of the time where you do need that data, you're going to save yourself hours upon hours of searching for stuff just by having it organized from the beginning. So while it will be a waste nine times out of 10, the one time out of 10 that you actually need the data will save you more time than you spent doing it across all 10 items. Does that kind of make sense? So I am making this dead easy for you guys. I am making this dead easy for you guys. If you look at your screen now, I have created the perfect tracker for you. The perfect tracker for you. On the left side, this is where we have all of the information about the stuff that we bought. And on the right side, this is all of the information about the stuff that we sold. All you need to do is put this data into this sheet. And as you put this data into the sheet, there's another page here called Business Overview. This will give you a great overview as to what your business looks like at a glance. So I'm going to go through here really quick, and I'm going to fill out some of this information for some fake sales, and we'll see how the sheet works. <coughs> so give me just a second here. 04-10-2023. Oh, maybe over just a little bit. All right, so let's say we bought a pair of Panda Dunks, uh, size 10. Mints. Okay. And we paid 110 bucks. We used cash. Uh, we bought this from Nordstrom. Uh, picture of receipt. We uploaded it to Google Drive. We have a link there. Market price when purchased is 150 bucks. Where is it? It's in my basement. Uh, notes uh, got from Emily at Nordstrom. Right. And let's say we bought a pair of uh, Jordan 1 or what are they, 11 taxis? I don't know. Uh, size 10.5. Men's. We bought this on for, let's say, 12, 2023. Uh, we paid, let's say, 100 bucks. Uh, we paid Zell. Uh, we got this from Chicago Emporium. Uh, here's our picture of our receipt. <clears throat> Market price was maybe 200 bucks. This is currently in my living room, right? And, um, I, it was uh, delivered on 418. And let's also say we got a pair of Jordan 4 Red Thunders. And we bought this on 413 or 14. 
We paid 200 bucks. Uh, we paid with our credit card. We found these on eBay. Here's our receipt. Uh, market price was like $325. Uh, this is currently in my bedroom, and um, we got these no box. And then let's say uh, we've only managed to sell one of these so far, just the Panda Dunks. And let's say we sold this on the 20th, right? And uh, we got paid out 150 bucks. Uh, payout method, this paid to our PayPal. We sold this on Instagram. Uh, here's a picture of the payment. Uh, we sent this out via UPS. Here's the tracking number. Uh, customer's name was Seb's Kicks. Uh, customer's email was sebskicks at sebi.com. Uh, phone number was this. And then um, hit me up in Instagram DMs. Okay. So now that I've put this information in, Look at what the sheet does for us. The sheet will do for you so much great stuff about your business. For one, it'll show you your lifetime purchases. This is the amount of purchases that you've made over the lifetime of your business. It'll also tell you your lifetime sales, right? So I've spent $410 on sneakers so far, and I've sold $150 worth of sneakers so far. This means that my average, li or sorry, that my lifetime profit so far are 260 bucks. However, when I've sold a pair of sneakers, the pairs of sneakers that I've sold have had an average ROI of 36.36%. It's had an average turnaround time of 10 days. My current inventory is 525 bucks, and the projected profits on that inventory will be $225. If you put your information into the sheet, it will keep track of all of this for you. And as you go on, this will help you over time, right? This will help you get a very good look at your business. And if you learn more about Google uh, Sheets, you can obviously manipulate this information in a hundred different ways to be able to get any of the information that you need. Here's the link, by the way, so that you guys can make copies for yourselves, right? So that you'll be able to do that. And I'll tell you right now, if you have this information, if you keep this sheet active, the amount of headaches that this is going to save you come tax season is worth its weight in gold. Because when it's time to pay taxes, all you need to do is hand this sheet to your accountant and say, here you go. This is everything that I've done in my business so far. This is everything that I've done in my business so far. Because you can also put in that you bought boxes, right? You can put in that you bought tape or packing peanuts or whatever the case is. You can put that all in over here and you can make sure that all of your information is going to be kept organized from the day you start your business to the day you end your business. It's going to help you all. Does this make sense? Packing peanut is crazy. So... All of this being said, step three is we're going to learn about our product acquisition and we're going to acquire our first products. Before we sell those products, before we sell those products, we need to be in step four. We need to do organization. So between the time that you buy that first product and the time that you sell that first product, you need to turn your focus onto your organization to make sure that you're keeping all of this information straight for your business in the long run. So, the step four, does organization make sense to you guys? Does this make sense to you guys? Yes? Perfect. Okay. So, next step here. Next step here. Let's move along to step five, which is sales. It is very tempting in this space to rely entirely on the platforms for sales. So it's very, very, very tempting to just use StockX and eBay and Mercari and Poshmark. But this should be done sparingly. When we use platforms to sell, we reject the value of establishing relationships with customers which could continue to pay us all the time. Consider whether you have ever become a repeat customer of an eBay store, an Amazon seller, or a seller on Goat. Have any of you ever become a repeat buyer of an eBay store? Have any of you ever become a repeat buyer of an eBay store? No, right? No, we don't remember the usernames of the people that we buy from on eBay. Have any of you ever become a repeat buyer knowingly of an Amazon store? 
No. Right? We don't we don't have brand loyalty on these platforms. People don't think that way on those platforms. Even if you spend a lot of time creating a really cool eBay store, a really cool Amazon store, chances are you are not gonna end up with repeat customers or brand loyalty that way. That's because people think of getting the product from the platform, not from the seller, right? So with this, we should prioritize developing relationships instead. Consider if the average sneakerhead buys a pair of shoes at least one time per month. If our average profit's $30 per pair, this means that developing a relationship with one sneakerhead is worth $360 annually. This isn't to say that we should never use apps to sell, rather that we should view app sales as being secondary to personalized sales. So, here's what I mean by this. Let's say you find one sneakerhead who buys a pair of shoes from you one time, right? If you're able to develop a relationship with that sneakerhead, and again, sometimes you won't be able to, but let's say you are, and that sneakerhead just buys one pair from you per month, you're going to make 360 bucks a year off of that sneakerhead. Now, no one's getting excited and jumping up and down and clapping their hands over 360 bucks, but consider if you were able to, over the course of a year, make 100 different relationships with sneakerheads. That's two per week. You're meeting one new sneakerhead twice per week. If you were able to do this twice per week, you're going to make $36,000 a year in profit on just sneakerheads alone. Just the sneakerheads in your network alone. And I get it, 100 sneakerheads sounds like a lot of relationships to manage, but this is over the course of an entire year, right? So just through the relationships with those sneakerheads, you're going to be earning over $36,000 a year in profit if you're able to do that, right? So, when you're getting started, consider the power of an email or text list. There are many services, and I'm, I'm giving you guys MailChimp and Community. These are really good services that give you the ability to email and text your customers in bulk. So, how many of you joined this server because of an email you got from me? How many of you joined this server because of an email you got from me? GZO did. A lot of you did. A lot of you joined from an email, right? And... As you guys are interacting with me, every single time you give me an email address, I'm keeping that email address. That gets added into the list, and that's the reason that I'm able to launch a group like Subsection to hundreds of people, right? Because I've kept those email addresses from the beginning. Imagine if every single time anybody had ever bought a pair of shoes from you, if all you had was their email address. If all you got was their email address from that transaction, how many email addresses would you have by now? And how much easier would it be to sell pairs of shoes? Unfortunately, you guys aren't currently tracking your data. And because you aren't tracking your data, it's harder and harder to sell sneakers and streetwear items. You guys have all probably sold Essentials t-shirts at some point before. With that being the case, imagine if you still had the email addresses and phone numbers of every single customer that's ever bought one of those pieces of essentials from you. If you still had those email addresses and phone numbers, you would be able to hit up those same people over and over and over again to buy those items when you had them. It's an extremely valuable tool, and MailChimp and Community will allow you to keep that stuff organized, right? Also, consider establishing a presence on social media to continue growing your audience of potential buyers, and over time, you'll have thousands of contacts to which you can sell your products. One thing that I'll ask you guys to consider is that going to a single sneaker event can yield you over 100 email addresses and phone numbers, right? And I get it. We don't like going to sneaker events, right? There's a ton of people there. It can be a little bit nerve-wracking. It's expensive, et cetera, et cetera, but Considering that you could get 100 email addresses in one sneaker event, right? Some of those may be suppliers, some of those may be buyers, some of those may be sellers, some of those may be store owners. How beneficial can that be over time? Because that's an email that we can be hitting up every single week with our new inventory, that we can be getting through sales even faster and faster. Maybe then we're going to be able to take our average turnaround time down from 10 days to maybe two days, right? This is another reason that it's so valuable to store our data, because with this, I can see, oof, it's taken me 10 days to sell an item on average. If I could get this down and my ROI stays the same, then I'm making more money over time. Okay, so step five being sales. 
we want to prioritize sales to individuals over sales on apps. And the way that we're going to do that is by gathering email addresses and phone numbers from the very onset of our business. Again, in the tracker that I gave you guys here, if I go over to the enter data here section and I scroll over, you'll see you have a place for your customer email and your customer phone number and your customer name. Store these every single time you sell something. You'll be shocked at how many of these you get over time and how valuable they are once you get them. Make sense? Also, let me go ahead and clear out this data so that you guys can make copies of it. Uh, do your thing. Oh. Okay. So, step five being sales. Prioritize individual sales over platform sales. Make sense? Perfect. Okay. So any questions about step five here? Any questions about step five? Doesn't seem like it. So the last step here is growth. This is the last step. Okay. Once we've completed the previous five steps, we will have the foundation of a profitable sneaker reselling business. Growing our business is as simple as picking one of our three growth areas. We're either going to grow through supply, we'll grow through sales, or we'll grow through efficiency. Okay? That's it. That's really all there is to it. So in these five steps, we learned about organizing our data. We learned about getting all of the stuff to start it. We learned about finding products and selling products. At the end of our business, all we need to do is pick one of these three areas, supply, sales, or efficiency. On the supply side, right, once we have some extra money, once we have our profitable business, we can consider using a small amount of money to test new suppliers. Here's what I mean by that. A lot of resellers get very wary about new suppliers. A lot of resellers get worried that they're going to get scammed. Scamming happens. If you're a reseller, you are going to get scammed. No question about it. No question about it. But if you're able to risk a certain amount of excess capital to test new suppliers, then what you're going to find is eventually you'll find worthy suppliers of your trust. You'll find trustworthy people. And you'll be able to use those people to make even more money. Again, you're going to get scammed when you go to find new suppliers. No question about it. But accept that at the onset and you'll be able to find the ones that are worthy of your trust right? You can also use excess capital to buy shoes and clothing items that are out of season to hold until their season of popularity. So for example, right now it's summertime, right? If you have some extra money, buy a whole bunch of sweatpants and hoodies, right? Maybe some Ugg boots, things like that. Things that are not popular in the summertime and just hold them until wintertime, right? Similarly, we're just transitioning into summer. During the winter, you could have been buying essentials teas, maybe some foams, maybe some slides, things like that at massive discounts in order to be able to sell during the summer months for massive profits, right? So these are just a couple of examples that we can think of to kind of grow our business on the supply side once we're making some money using the other previous steps. Finally, we can also use some money to influence the opinions of store managers and account holders to help us secure better inventory. Maybe take your local uh, Foot Locker manager out to a dinner, right? Maybe drop off a nice pair of shoes for your local uh, Nordstrom sales associate, right? You can use some money to influence some opinions on the supply side as well. So that's how we can grow on supply. And these are just examples. There's obviously a million ways to do this. On the sales side, Consider using some excess capital to advertise our business. Large sneaker theme pages on Instagram, for example, can cost a couple hundred bucks to advertise on, but taking advantage of those large audiences can build our own for hundreds or thousands of additional customers for our own business. Imagine if we just advertise once on one of these large sneaker pages to get a bunch of email addresses. We already saw the value of having a large email list, and we can use a little bit of excess capital to build that further. Right? We can also use excess capital to attend out-of-town sneaker events. That way we can meet with people in person. That can be a tremendous way to build our network. And finally, we can grow our sales avenues through the use of Discord servers or subreddits, as those can also be incredible resources to sell products. Again, all of these things cost money. We've got to be able to make some money with the other five steps first, but these are ways that we can grow. 
And then finally, on the efficiency side, consider hiring an accountant or attorney to help scale our business. Sometimes we can save a lot of money transforming our LLC into a C-Corp. Other times we might be overlooking valuable tax write-offs. We can also invest into tools like bots and monitors or even enterprise-level credit solutions to open large amounts of capital to facilitate growth. So on the growth side... It's all a matter of taking the money that we made from these last five steps, reinvesting it into either supply, sales, or efficiency, and then starting over again, right? It's all rinse, repeat once we get through these steps. And if you follow these steps, everything will stay very well organized. Everything will be very easy to follow. And you shouldn't have too many issues doing it. Any questions on the growth side of things here? Any questions on the growth side of things? No. Excellent. In which case, those are the six steps that you need to start and grow a sneaker reselling business. Let's stop the